amazing for me, I have to say, in this particular process, because I'm going to have to go to the uh, correct um, the correct slide for the answers that you give when you are asked to uh, to vote. And there are a number of options, and we can go down a number of different avenues. We can then go back to the beginning and see whether you would like to change the option that you have actually selected and see how the scenario would have played out if, you'd, if we'd done it differently. So, we are starting now. Um, and uh, here is the case itself. The case of Andy Dufresne. People read at different speeds. So if you could just look down when you've read it all, that will give me a sense of when to uh, click the mouse. And I sense that you've all now read that, so we can move on to the question, what you as the consultant should do next at this point. And you have five options. So we've got the option now to see how you voted on this. Enormous number assessing the patient's capacity. Um, but some of you talking about discussing the DNR status with the patient. Probably two of you <coughs> talking about discussing the DNR status with the next of kin. Um, and some of you writing the order straight away. So, let's see what happens if you assess capacity. And I now need to go to slide 38. This is where my mechanical skills could let me down, but in this particular instance, they were successful. So, what are you going to do now then? So we've got 85 responses. A large number of you seeking a second opinion here. Is this nervousness on your part because you're thinking of doing this as a medical student and you think I couldn't possibly take the responsibility for this at the moment? I don't know. Anybody like to comment on the response that they have made? Who wants it? Who's Given that there's nearly 20% of you discussing status with the uh, next of kin, would anybody like to say why you chose that as an option? I, I, I couldn't take second opinion because I'm not sure you assume the possibility. None of the other options assume the patient's capacity, so you need to... So if you're not sure, you, you would assume capacity because capacity would be your general presumption under the Mental Capacity Act, but if you're not sure, that's why you go for a second opinion. Okay, that's, uh, that's a, a logical route to that, uh, that ending. What about discussing the status with the next of kin? Um, so I thought that seeing as you weren't sure if you had capacity or not, it sounds medically trained and is known as, obviously known as father for a lot longer, so he might have a good idea and he'll know the sort of protocols around DNA forms anyway, so he'd be a good person to chat to. Right, so he's a, he's a bit like a second opinion so as well as a relative yeah. in, that, in the way that you're, you're seeing him uh, there. Although obviously he'd be used to Canadian standards, yeah. which are, are like to be broadly similar, but there will be some differences uh, there. Um, anybody talking about postponing? The decision. Well, that might give you um, a chance to maximise the patient's potential for capacity for the decision. So you might, it's, it says that there is sort of lucidity and confusion. My understanding of what you're supposed to do is give, give the patient the best possible opportunity to make the decision. And that's certainly totally consistent with the Mental Capacity Act, isn't it? That, uh, that you should try at least to find a t one of the things that you would do, find a time when the patient is likely 
to be, to be more uh, able to make their own autonomous decisions. So, I mean, it seems to me you've got a ra the three people who have spoken have all had rational bases for the decisions that they have made. Uh, as there's only two people who are writing the DNAR order. I'm slightly surprised that's gone down, actually, rather than up from the 5% that we had to start with. But maybe peer pressure, even where it's anonymous, has had an effect. I don't actually know how that would have worked out. Um, on that basis, we should see what happens when you obtain a second opinion. And... <coughs> And at this point, we do actually get to look at what the sun's wishes are, because you're wondering what on earth to do next. Um, and you have another chance to vote. Now I think that we've got most of the responses in. Just turn, if you're in the threes, sort of within the, uh, within the rows at the side, just turn and talk to one another and form yourselves into threes and twos here just to say what it was you decided and why you felt that was the appropriate option before we go on to see what, uh, what has actually come up. I'll give you a couple of minutes to do that. <laughs> Well, let's see what you actually did, because you may be sat with people who are like-minded, or you may not be sat with people who are like-minded, and wonder what actually the outcome was. Mmm! That's interesting. That's a terms of an outcome. Um, that's a very interesting set of outcomes indeed that we have there. So it's pretty close, isn't it, as to whether you do write the order or you contact the GP. So let's look at what happens when you write the order. And all being well, we go to slide 36, which will tell you what happens. OK, so let's go on and see what the outcome actually is when you do that. You can probably see as a cardiac arrest. <laughs> I'm being videoed, so I won't say exactly what the response might be when you get that phone call, but I guess you can imagine one or two choice phrases that you might actually uh, use when the patient advice liaison service actually gets in touch with you. Mm. So that's not perhaps the happiest outcome that you might have had. So you could of course have gone a different route, couldn't you? Um, and if we go back to uh, what you actually were deciding at the beginning of this in terms of what the consultant should do, we had a lot of you assessing capacity and we did have those who were uh, discussing this with the patient. Um, so we could see what happens if you discuss this with the patient. Or at least you could, if I could find where I'd need to go with that. So I think we'll... Yes, I can find that. In just a nasty moment when I wasn't quite certain where I was going to go with that. So here you are. You do that. It seems a fair thing to do, but then, of course, what you find yourself uh, doing at that stage is that you have unclear capacity. <coughs> and so you've got to work out what you do next here. <coughs> and then I'll take you to slide 45 where you've already made some decisions about what you would do at this point. <coughs> and a lot of you 
wanted to obtain a second opinion, we went down that route. Um, let's go down another route. Let's go down um, postponing the decision because there were some people who thought that postponing was actually worth doing. And so we go to slide 39, here we are. It can wait, after all, he might get better. You never know. Um, and I think you've been there before. You will recognize that slide. Um, and that's how the scenario could actually work out. But at some point, I was surprised actually a few, oh, no, sorry. I was going to say I was surprised so few of you wanted to contact the hospital legal team. Um, now maybe that's reassuring, or maybe you know what the legal team would have said. So anybody who didn't want to contact the hospital legal team, say why they felt confident to go down another route. Do you not have much confidence in lawyers? You couldn't contact the legal team in every situation like that, so it might be just inappropriate. This isn't a real sort of threshold. You haven't crossed what might be a higher threshold. Is that fair enough? The reason I'm rephrasing what you're saying is that what is going on uh, now is also going to be recapped, uh, as I understand it. And if you don't actually have your question going through the microphone here, that may mean that it can't be heard. So, you know, I can hear you, but I just want to make sure that the microphone can and that we, uh, we look at that again. Yeah, that's uh, certainly possible. Yes? So also, you don't know all the details yet, so if you contact the GP first, then you'll be able to see if there are any advanced directives or if there's a legal power of attorney who you need to contact rather than the son. So you should do that first. So contacting the GP seems better because if you contact the legal team, they, you don't have enough information to give them. And it's certainly true that if ever you contact anybody who is an expert in inverted commas, they always ask you questions that you've not thought of and make you feel a bit silly that you don't know the answer. But on the other hand, that's why you contact an expert, isn't it? You expect them to know more um, and you may not even have considered the questions that they're asking you. So that sounds as though we should go down the route of looking at what happens if you contact the patient's GP. Um, However, that's, that's such a good thing to do that I'd like to contact the uh, legal team first just, <laughs> just to enable you to see what happens when you do um, in this particular case. Don't go straight to the uh, phrase at the beginning of the last paragraph, but uh, I suspect that might have been what you, uh, what you thought would happen. You can get this rather frustrating advice sometimes if you ring one of the defence uh, organisations as well, um, when you'd really like somebody else to make the decision for you, but sometimes it is your responsibility to make a decision. So, <coughs> thinking that there's not much help there, uh, you might actually go back to the GP, which so many of you wanted to do, and see what actually happens when you contact the patient's GP. So, here we are. So you do that, and let's see what happens once you've done that. So, that was the only way you got that information, was to get in touch with the GP. Of course, this has an element of artificiality about it because this story has been crafted and it could have been so different. You could have got in touch with the GP and the GP might have said, well, he's only recently um, become a patient of this practice. So actually, I don't know. Or we've never seen this man before. He's never consulted. And uh, so we don't have any information about this. There's a whole range of possibilities, but I hope that this has been one way of helping you see through 
a do not attempt resuscitation decision and to see what actually might, uh, might happen there. Um, I think we've covered most of the possibilities that we could have gone down uh, doing this and I hope that you found that interesting and has had some value clearly because I wouldn't have offered it to you otherwise but there is just a brief questionnaire to fill in to see what you think or survey to fill in what you think about this whole process um, and there is a, a prize draw for entrance of a £100 Amazon voucher or two £50 Amazon vouchers. I'm very, very embarrassed that these are Amazon vouchers. When this was decided, the information that they were not paying tax in the UK had not come out. And here we are doing something in ethics, which looks as though it is endorsing Amazon. Should you be lucky enough to win, you might like to make your views known that having benefited from a medical education partially at the expense of the taxpayer and uh, going on to work in a cash-strapped NHS, you might actually feel that Amazon could usefully contribute to the tax take in this country. So, thank you very much for that. We will carry on in just a moment. Um, but you can fill these in as we go through. Can I make a comment on the case, Brian? Indeed, yes. you can make a comment on the case. The, uh, so the, the case is a good one primarily because it's a very, very usual situation. So that'll be happening three or four times a day in this hospital, and almost every time I'm on call, we deal with something like that. And one of the annoyances of an intensive is somewhat is a focus on do not attempt resuscitation. Before this patient's heart stops, he's going to deteriorate physiologically over a period of hours or days. And so the actual decision in, in real practice is, to what extent am I going to support this patient? What organ support is appropriate to institute? Is it appropriate to ventilate this patient? Is it appropriate to start uh, uh, inotropic support for blood pressure or renal support should you go into renal failure? So that, that's actually the real question. A whole set of physiological things happen before the heart stops. And it's, it's the same decision-making process, but it is different. And there are different levels and ceilings of care that you can appropriately put on for an individual in, in this setting. So it's not really, DNAR is the wrong question at that point, although that will form, it's a subset of the decision-making about how we're going to treat an 80-year-old with severe COPD, who's sepsis, hypoxemic, with dementia, etc. And the decision making into where you're going to set the appropriate level of care, including DNAR, you know, is, is appropriately gone through there. And it is about gleaning information uh, from people who know the patient, from uh, absolutely GP, from care and hospital teams, uh, from family, from the medical acute and chronic situation you see in front of you, uh, and, and so forth. So, and one of the things about the protocol within not just this hospital but other hospitals is that you would be expected to attempt a resuscitation if there is no order within the notes. Now that can be quite uncomfortable because you may well know that you're not going to be remotely successful with a particular patient and that you're going through the motions. And you may know that next day, when a consultant comes on and hears that you have attempted to resuscitate a patient, I wonder whether you'd like to say what you think the reaction might actually be, Leslie. Yeah. Well, it depends on the situation. But my, my concern is that if you don't make a decision, you are actually making a decision. Because if you, if you don't make a decision not to resuscitate, you're saying the team must attempt resuscitation. And the clinical, the, even before you get to the ethical questions, I would say your clinical question is, would this patient benefit from resuscitation? And if you've got an illness which is not primary cardiac, and they're in the dying process, then attempting resuscitation will be futile. <coughs> and then you get the ethics, is this the best for the patient? So I think the first question is, is the patient going to benefit from resuscitation? And if not, you should have the honesty to say so to the patient and the family. Because there's nothing worse than the resuscitation running to the patient, they may get the circulation going again, 
but then you're in the dilemma, the patient's intubated, you're handbagging in the ward, they've got to be admitted to intensive care. And if you've made the clinical decision that you're not going to use ventilation to treat this patient with severe COPD and chest infection, then by definition you bounce yourself into that decision by default. So by not making decisions, you are making decisions, so just keep that in mind. And that may be useful to you, I think, as, a, as foundation doctors, because in order to ensure that you don't get in a situation where you are attempting to resuscitate in circumstances where it would be very unlikely that you would be successful, there is something that you could do beforehand. What do you think that is? <coughs> Any thoughts as to what you might do? Because you can't write a uh, do not attempt resuscitation order. Who can? Who's likely to write that? Consultant. The consultant, absolutely. You can influence that consultant by asking at any time, what's the resuscitation status of this patient? For all sorts of reasons, a consultant may not have actually written something in the notes, conceivably might not have considered it, but if you ask, then it is much more likely that a decision will be made. And as, as a. Hamilton says, if a decision is not made, actually, that in itself is a decision. Leave the survey results at the back, but now we're moving on to the next session, uh, next part of this session, which Gus Vincent is going to be doing. Just while Gus is getting ready, I'd support Brian in that. It's your job to challenge your seniors. Now, it may be uncomfortable. Um, they may not like it sometimes. But if you're acting in the patient's best interest, then sometimes you will have to challenge that. And by challenging, you will get decisions. So don't be afraid to do that. If it's a good consultant, he's a good doctor, they will uh, appreciate that. Maybe not at the time, but certainly later. <laughs> so, so remember that you heard that from a consultant cardiothoracic surgeon and not from an ethics lecturer. And the name is Professor Dark. <laughs>